God doesn't need a whole bunch of people. He doesn't need a large group. He doesn't need a big church to establish his kingdom. What he needs is two or three in agreement. <laughs> That's what he needs. Now, two or three thousand or twenty or thirty thousand. We just make you can make a lot of noise and just make a lot more noise, but you're not establishing anything. And so, you know, God works in the small. In fact, it's easier to get, well, I don't know if it's easier, but yeah, it is, to get a few in agreement and in alignment and all pulling the same direction than it is to get a, a lot of people because everybody's got their own ideas. Everybody's got their own opinions of everything. And um, that's not, God can't move in that. God can't work in that mixture, right? And so, you know, all through the Bible, you see that the enemy is always fighting against what God is wanting to establish. Because the enemy is trying to keep the kingdom from coming and being established in the earth like it is in heaven. Because this is his habitation. This is where he is. It's like his prison where he was put and locked here for thousands of years now. And he, you know, he's not allowed to go into the third heaven anymore. So he makes war in the heavenlies, but that's just the, the atmosphere above us. Okay? But he does not have access any longer to all the places in the heavenly realms. And through Christ, we have access to all of those realms. And what's in heaven is supposed to be established in the earth. So the enemy is always at work trying to keep God's chosen, God's people, from establishing on the earth what's in heaven. What, what God wants to see built and established on earth, which is his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The part of the Lord's Prayer there in Matthew chapter, uh, what is it, 6 or 10? I can't remember, 6 I think. But anyway, so the enemy is always at work trying, and you know what? He, he always attacks the priesthood. Now, let me say this. Through Jesus Christ, now the order of Melchizedek, we're all kings and priests, right? We're all the priesthood. We make up, all of us, all believers in Jesus are the priesthood. So it's a many-membered body priesthood. It's not just a, for a select few anymore. See, this is, that's a religious concept, an idea. It's whosoever will. All are called, many are called, but few are chosen. All received an invitation into it, but only a few are selected because they disqualify themselves. Because we choose not to show up. Or we choose only to show up sometimes. We, we choose to, you know, um, I can't remember the exact quote. I heard, I heard Justin Paul Abraham say this. He was quoting Bill Johnson, Bethel Church. You know, and basically what Bill was saying was, we've, we've given, we've surrendered enough of our heart to be saved, but we haven't surrendered enough of our heart to establish the kingdom, to see the greater signs, wonders, and miracles. It's about consecration. It's about sanctification. It's about setting ourselves fully apart. We set ourselves apart enough to be saved and born again. But we haven't yet, I believe, set our... We're not fully committed. We say we want to be and we're making the right confessions. But there has to be an action that follows a confession. Amen? In other words, it's just empty words. And we're all guilty of this. We all come short. God's looking for a people that are fully committed, fully immersed, fully under the overshadowing and control of the Holy Spirit, where we really have ceased from our own works. We have completely stopped doing our will, and we only do the will of the Father. Who's that a picture of? Jesus Christ. He's the only picture to follow. He's the only pattern son that did that. So, there is a remnant, there is a seventh, there is an end time generation that will seek his face, not just his hand. That's what Psalms 24 is talking about. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? Who will go into the heavenly realms? Most people aren't willing to do that because it takes another level of sacri sacrifice, another level of consecration. The closer you go to God, the, the higher you go in God, and the more that you are seeking Him, there, 
it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit in us that sanctifies us. We can't sanctify ourselves. It's not through the washing of the water like in the tabernacle of Moses or the, the temple of Solomon. It's not a natural thing. We cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot make ourselves grow up. And that's the word that I heard the Lord, what he was saying to me was this morning, was it, it's time to enter into maturity. It's time to mature. It's time to grow up. It's time to put away the childish things. And so I was doing a little study on that and looking that up earlier at, as the Lord was speaking to me about that, looking some scriptures, you know. So I was thinking, okay, what's the word maturity or to be mature in Hebrew? So I came, there's lots of words for it, but I came across a few that I thought were really powerful. And I'm going to share those with you. Um, you know, when you think about maturity, most people, you're thinking about an older person, right? You're thinking about the gray heads. Thinking about people that are, have some age on them. Well, really, age really has nothing to do with it other than usually in order to have a, 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 a large amount or quantity of experience, you have to live a little while. Because that experience is still the best teacher. We learn from our mistakes, hopefully. And you got to make some mistakes in order to learn, to mature. God wants to take every mistake that we've ever made and use it for our maturity. Amen? He wants us to learn from those things and to grow up, to mature. And I've said this before, but Christ, Christ is a picture of the mature son, right? A mature son. A son that walked in the maturity, which what? Qualified him to walk in the fullness. It prepared him and set him apart to walk in the fullness of the Godhead. The Bible says that the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him bodily. Jesus functioned in the fullness of the Spirit. Not just a measure, not just a gifting. It was greater than a gifting. Jesus operated in the glory realm. And the glory is the presence of God. Jesus carried with him, not only in him, but around him, the atmosphere of heaven. He operated in the glory. And it wasn't just a measure of the glory. He was walking in the fullness of the glory. Jesus could see everything from beginning to ending. Jesus could do anything. There was nothing impossible for him, was there? Whatever was needed... He had the power and authority to do it, to create it, to accomplish it, to fulfill it. And he was a picture, you know, the patterned son, that book written by Bill Bright. He was and is the patterned son. And that's who we should be looking to. That's what we should be becoming like him. You see, in the beginning, Adam was made in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in the image and likeness of God. Right? But Adam was immature. Adam had to mature as a son. Now, he, he had a great deal going. He had an open heaven. He had access to the Garden of Eden where God would walk up and down in the cool of the day. Right? Adam, the son, had access, full access to the Father. He wasn't inhibited. He wasn't limited. If he needed something, he'd just go ask the Father. He said, I'd have a conversation with the Father. And the Father would teach the Son. Train Him, equip Him, share His heart with Him. Think about that. But through Jesus Christ, we also have been given full access. We just don't take full advantage of what we've been given. And that's the problem. But maturity, mature ones are coming. God is raising up mature ones in this day. He will have a bride that is equal to the bridegroom. 
immaturity. Isn't that what Ephesians chapter 4 talks about? Okay, let me, let me start there. I wasn't going to start there, but I'll just start there because we all know this scripture. And I know there's some out there that teach. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That the fivefold ministry no longer exists. That it's all been fulfilled, so we don't need them. I mean, if I name names, you would, you would be amazed. But I'm not going to name names. But it, this Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, right? Fivefold. I don't believe pastor teacher is like one gift. You know, there was another teaching that came out just a few years ago about there were really only four. No, there's five. <laughs> so you have five fingers on your hand, five toes, you know. God works in fives. He likes that. But it's the, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. You know what? They're still in existence. The, the gifts are still in here. They're still in the body. They've been given. The mantles are still resting on those that are called and those that have been made themselves ready and have been equipped and have been selected. For what purpose? Verse 12, 412, Ephesians 412. For the perfecting. Okay, that word is a word that you could use for maturity. Okay? It's the uh, it's the word in Greek, kartartismos, whatever it is. But it means to be complete or to be furnished. You know, or fully equipped. It's, 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 it's not talking about uh, something being complete like, you know, you've lived all these years and then you die. And so the fullness would be you dying. The fullness of the age, the fullness of your years, the fullness of your life. Completely full or complete, you come to the end of it and there you go, you're dead. You have completed it. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about maturity. It's just talking about maturity. It has nothing to do with death. It has nothing to do with the number of years that you've lived. Okay? So, and when I looked in the Hebrew, it had this same type of meaning. The same idea. You know, of being complete or fully furnished. Or being fully ready. Fully equipped. Fully prepared. Are you with me? That's maturity. So for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry. What work are we supposed to be doing? Jesus told us to do the same works that he did. But then we were going to even greater works. Do the works and even greater works. Now I, I don't know. I really have never seen anybody yet. Doing the greater work. Greater than what Jesus did. Now you can twist that a little bit. And put your own idea in there. Well, yeah but that means because there's going to be millions of Christians. Not just Christ. That, that's the more works. There's probably some truth in that. But I don't really think. I've never really found God to, to deal. To move because of quantity. He's about quality. <laughs> and so. I believe there's a generation that's going to do the greater works. I really do. Because Jesus was the, the first seed. Jesus was the first son. Jesus was, you know, he was the first mature son. Now, you know, a different word in, in the Greek. There's two words for sons. Technon or weos. And I'm probably not saying it right. But that's the way Paul Keith Davis says it. So I'm going with that. But, you know, a technon, they use that when they're talking in the scriptures about a child. Which Isaiah 9, 6, which I'm going to read here in a minute. A child, you know, a child is born, and it says, but a son is given. Two different words. In the Greek, it would be technon, like a little baby, an infant, or a real immature son. Or weos here, a fully grown, fully completed, furnished, equipped son. A mature son. Immature to mature. Immaturity, maturity. Not ready, ready. <laughs> you get the idea. A weos. So for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to do the works of Jesus and greater works. 
No, I won't say that. For the edifying, I'm not going to be negative or critical this morning. For the edifying or the building up or the establishing and completing the body of Christ. The body of Christ. So the job of the fivefold ministry, and I'm not, that's not what I'm ministering on, but it's coming out. It's what to build up the body. Not to get a large body, but to get a pure body. To get a body that looks like Christ. The body of Christ. To bring them into that place of maturity. Verse 13. Which is what I want to read. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. That's why I know that the fivefold ministry is not gone yet. Because there is not unity in the body of Christ yet. <laughs> There's a lot of disunity. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And I don't believe that everybody that confesses they're Christians all going to, the whole church worldwide is going to be in unity. I don't believe that's what it means either. It means true believers, believing believers. Again, many are called. That word called really means to be invited. Everybody gets the invitation. But few, many are called, but few are chosen. Or the word is selected. All get the invitation. But who gets selected? Those that show up. Those that stay. They, those that are willing to participate. And grow. And be a part. And not keep pulling up your roots. And replanting here. You know, I don't like that. Pull up your roots and run over here and plant here. Oh, I don't really like that. Pull up your roots and run over here. Let's try this for a while. It's not based on our likes and dislikes. It's based on the will of God. Where does, where, where does the Father want you planted? Wherever He plants you, be planted there until He moves you. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be moved because God will transplant. You know, God has certain seasons for everything. I believe that God operates in seasons. That's what I'm talking about because I believe we're coming into a season of maturity. And we can't mature ourselves. Can't, are we... A part of it, yes. We have a part to play. And we have to play our part or we will not mature. One of the parts that we have to play is we have to be open to fresh revelation. We have to be open to learn what we don't know yet. See, the, the, the hardest lessons are the lessons that you have to earn, learn what you learned wrong. When you have to unlearn what you thought was right. That's hard. It really is. To unlearn those things that were wrong. That we thought were right with all of our heart. And then God says. You know that was really kind of your immaturity there. And it was also kind of the people you were with. Their immaturity there. I'm trying to bring you up to another level. So I'm going to teach you. What, you. what was wrong in that. So you can learn from your mistake. So you can grow from the mistake into a higher place of maturity. Get some wisdom. Some understanding. You know, it's not just more knowledge. People with a high IQ can read the Bible and memorize and quote scriptures. That's called being religious. A lot of people can do that. But having a great knowledge does not mean that you're mature. Because knowledge without application is, revelation without application, it just puffs you up. It just produces pride in you. Lucifer had lots of knowledge, the knowledge of God. He didn't have all the knowledge he thought he did. He thought God revealed everything that he knew and was to him. Because he had access. But there were some things God had hidden in his heart that he hadn't shared with anyone. Except his closest, which was his son, Jesus. Or Mashiach, um, Yeshua Mashiach, Yeshua HaMashiach, Christ the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. And so Lucifer was lifted up in pride and that whole mess didn't turn out so good. You know, that's kind of a sign of immaturity too. When you think you know it all, but you don't. But you can't, you can't, you don't have ears to hear. You don't have eyes to see because you think you're right. A man is right in his own eyes every time. But God knows our hearts. 
And we need to be open and let him speak to us, speak the truth to us in love when we're wrong. Change is good, but it's not easy. Lion King movie verse. Thir verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or say mature teleos, a mature man. Unto the, this is the, God gives the definition of maturity right here in the verse. A mature man, what? Is one who has the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow. The measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. That's maturity. That's what we're striving. That's what we're, that's the, you know, the goal that's the prize at the end you know jesus is the prize he is the goal he is what we're going after i want to mature to this place and so the lord you know spoke to me this morning he said it's time you grow up it's time to enter into maturity it's time that you put away these childish behaviors these childish thinking this this Immature way of looking at things, doing things, all of that. Acting foolishly. Hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Kids do a lot of foolish things because they're immature. It comes with the territory. But we're supposed to be maturing. And when you start to mature, Paul said you got to put away the childish things. Because those foolish things... There's no wisdom in it. There's no maturity in it. There's no understanding in it. And if you, you know, if you hired a bunch of eight-year-olds that had never had any training in building anything and didn't understand anything about foundations or how to, you know, put things together, knew nothing about architecture, knew nothing about engineering, had no training whatsoever, just told them to go out and, and build me a, a, a skyscraper. You know? Or go out and build me a boat. I'm going to sail across the world in. How many of you are going to get in that boat the eight-year-olds built and take off? Nobody. Because they're immature. They don't have knowledge. They don't have understanding. They don't have wisdom. They don't have experience. They have not... They're sons that have not been taught by their father on how to do the things of the father. The father's a shipbuilder. But they don't know. He's had years of experience building ships. And he found out a lot of times the hard way what worked and what didn't work. First built, boat he probably built sunk somewhere along the line. Or didn't withstand the storm. And so, you're not going to, God's not going to use a bunch of eight-year-olds to establish his kingdom. Hallelujah. He wants sons that grow past that age. That come into maturity. That have experience that have understanding and wisdom and i was thinking about oh god how, how do i put away these childish things because i keep doing stupid stuff i keep thinking wrong i keep just acting immaturely it's the best way i know how to say it the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ that's the goal and I believe the Lord was speaking to me this morning. That it's a supernatural work. We have our part to play. But God also has his part to play in it. That we cannot get there without him. We cannot mature to that place without him. Let me read. Uh, since I'm in the New Testament. Let me read another scripture. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 13, verse 11. Paul says in Corinthians to the Corinthian church. To the body there. The people like you and I. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man. I put away childish things. Now if you look up that word man there. It actually has the meaning of a young man or a male that has grown up 
And that is now reached an age of maturity where he's ready to be a husband and a father. So that's to do with a man growing to a measure of maturity that is ready to take on that responsibility. To be a husband like God is a husband. To be a father like God is the father. To be a provider and a protector for a family. To produce sons and daughters at an age with experience, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to be able to teach the children the ways of the father. That's what that word really is talking about. Is referencing here. Paul said, you know, be an adult. Grow up. Act like a man. You know, man up. <laughs> what does that mean? Because you can tell, you know, you can tell somebody to man up these days. And their manning up is acting like a fool. Being a child. Doing childish things. <laughs> you know, man up. getting Go punching somebody out. Whatever. Getting in a fight or just doing something stupid. Going out driving 140 miles an hour, you know, down the highway to show you're a man. Putting dual glass packs on your car. So you sound like I'm a man. Listen to this manly car I drive. That's not what he's talking about. Maturity. Has everything to do with the idea of marriage. And family. Having a wife. And holiness. And sanctification. All of that. A family of God. That's what he was saying. To these Corinthians. He wasn't talking to a bunch of kids. This wasn't kids church. So it wasn't during children's church. He was talking to the church. The men and women of God. That were supposed to be mature. And we know. What was the Corinthian church? They were playing. They were being foolish. They were using the gifts. But they weren't bringing any glory to God. They were just like little kids playing. With the gifts. Like at Christmas time. Paul says that's not what these are about. That's not what you're about. You're supposed to be maturing and operating in the glory realm. In the glory. In the fullness of God. Like Jesus the son did. Hmm. Let me go to another scripture. Thank you Lord. Where do I want to go? Let's go to Genesis chapter 18. <clears throat> I like the number 18 a lot. You know to me 18. Speaks of righteousness. Because it's the Zadik, the 18th letter. So when I say 18, I think of the righteousness of God. It's the first thought I have. And it's chapter 18, verse 12. Anytime I think of 12, I think of kingdom government. Governmental. Power and authority. Genesis 18, 12 says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord? Being old also. Now that last two words. Are the words. Old also. That I want to center in on. Because that's a word. That actually is a word for maturity. Or to be a mature one. And we know what's going on here right. Sarah's 90. Abraham's 99. And God says you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a son. That I'm going to renew you. And I'm going to re even renew your body. And the natural. The physical. So that you can have sexual intercourse. And conceive. And grow a baby in your womb Sarah. And have the strength and energy to birth. And give delivery to that baby boy. Because that's the promised son. And so she laughs at the promise of God. Because she sees herself as. You know I'm too old. I can't do, God, do you not see me? I'm 90. And I know they lived longer back then, but by the time of Abraham, they were already learning how to die really good. Okay? They, they'd already learned how to die. They're, they're getting it. You know, Adam didn't know how to die. It took him 930 years to figure out how to die. For sin to work in him death. The wages of sin is what? Death. So if we ever learn how to live above sin, without sin in our life, Get the leaven out. I think maybe we'll, we can reverse this aging process. At least the dying process. And live a little longer. That'd be nice I think. <clears throat> anyway. So this verse. 
And being old also. The, this word that's used here is the word zakain. Or zakon. Okay? And really it has the idea of not being old as in you've reached the end of your years and it's over. You know, and now it's time to die. No, it's talking about being mature enough. About reaching an age of maturity where you're ready now to do something significant. To take on the responsibility of fulfilling the will of God in your life. To doing the works of Jesus and greater works than these. If I put it in New Testament language. Becoming mature enough to handle and fulfill the promise of God for our life. For her life. Hey, there's Harlow. To be old. <laughs> I'm just reading out of the Strong's. Become old. To show age. But it, does, it has nothing to do with death. So this idea of completing. You know, he will complete the work that he's begun in me. That doesn't mean you finally get, you know, completion is when you die. That's not completion. That's called done. <laughs> it's over. You don't get to do anymore. Here. It's talking about a man or woman with wisdom. With maturity. With understanding. And. It's the word. Zakain. Zakan. Zakim. And when I looked up. That word in the Hebrew. Went a little bit deeper. Okay. I found out something really. Really interesting. The first letter. There's only three letters. That make up that word. Stay with me please. This is important. <laughs> okay. It's a Zion. Which is the, the seventh letter. It's a cough or kuf. It's the kuf, which is the 19th letter. And a noon, which is the um, 14th letter. The noon. So it's a zion cough, or not cough, zion kuf noon. But what's important, one of the things important is the numerical value. The small gematria of that is 13. And I've said this a lot. 13 in Hebrew is the letter, the number for love. So what is, what is, what is God saying here? What God spoke to Abraham and Sarah. By the way, they had, they had had a nature change back in chapter 17. And their names got changed from Sarai to Sarah. From Abram to Abraham. He added the hay because they beheld the face of God and they were transformed. You get in the presence of God and you behold His face. That's how you mature. You begin to be changed. Because what you behold, you become. What you look at, you follow. What you focus on, you're going to follow that. And you're going you're to take on that image and that likeness of what you're gazing upon. What you're thinking upon. What you're spending your time upon. What you're giving yourself to. You know, science, now, I mean... You know, through research and studies that they've done, husbands and wives that have been married for many, many, many years, the longer they're married, the more they begin to look like each other. They take on each other's natures. It's a, it's a principle. So Sarah laughed at the promise, but God, you know, God wasn't laughing. And God had changed her, but God was about to change her again. To do a deeper work of transformation. To do a deeper work of change. And that's what I'm talking about. I believe the Lord is speaking to me that we're the generation and we're entering, in, entering into that time where we're about to be changed again. Where there is a deeper work of sanctification for a deeper transformation to take place. And it's not by what we do or we don't do. It's more about what He has already done. But it's the work that He's doing in us. God is working in us both what? To do and to will of His good pleasure. So it's a work that God is doing in us. And I believe we're, we're stepping over that threshold into that in the 2020. In the 5780. We're, about, we're entering in. There's a, there's, God is going to do a deeper work. God is going to do a greater work. And again, we have to submit to it. We have to be willing to partner with him in it and let him have his way. All are invited. Whosoever can come, but only a few show up and really stay and commit.
And that's what I'm talking about. I want to be in that army. I want to be in that remnant. I want to be a part of that group. The end time group that are mature sons and daughters of God. <clears throat> Let me read a couple of the scriptures and I'm going to stop. But I love, I love these scriptures. Isaiah. I love Isaiah. I love Jeremiah. I love these old guys. These prophets of God. Don't you? <laughs> I really do. Because why? Because they're mature. They have wisdom here. They have understanding. They've walked with God through some stuff. You know, this isn't a book that, that Isaiah wrote, you know, when he was like 10 years old or something. Now, this is a mature man of God, a holy prophet, a mature prophet of God. You know, and there's, there's this, this, there's still these two talking heads, true head, false head, and they're both talking. They're still both talking. This false head needs to be shut up. And the way you do that is you cut the head off. Then he can't talk anymore. But it's still going on right now. There's all this talking, talking, talking. And there's, there's a lot of teaching and talking right now that, that about false prophets again. You know what? An immature prophet is not a false prophet. Sorry. A prophet who made a mistake is still not a false prophet. It's a prophet that made a mistake. A man that made a mistake is not... You know, a child, he's a man that made a mistake. And so, let's not confuse the two. Because we're all in this together and we're all growing up. And you'll know them by their fruit. The fruit, but not... You've got to let the fruit mature. You've got to let it grow. This is Isaiah 53, 2. Speaking of Christ, of course, the prophetic promise. For he shall grow up before him... As a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form, no comeliness, and we, when, we, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And it's, this is a prophetic word about Messiah that was coming. God was telling me he's not going to come like all your other kings. He's not going to come with this great coronation and procession and being carried on this carriage, you know, with all this interlaid with gold and all the tapestry and these beautiful horses all dressed and the army going before him and all the band playing and all that stuff. That's not how he's coming. That's what he was telling them. He will grow up before him as a tender plant. Jesus had to grow up too. Jesus had to mature as a son of God. As a child of God. Just like we do. To grow up before him. You know that word is actually the word panim. Shall grow up, in other words, before the face of God. In other words, God was watching every step, every day, every year. God is watching the maturity of his sons and daughters. And his desire is that we would grow up. Christ had to grow up. Christ had to mature. And this is really interesting. You may not like this, but... That word grow up here is not the same word that I used while ago, zakim. It's the word Allah, which means to ascend or to go up. We got to go up to grow up. I believe as God is teaching a generation that is learning how to go up and in and to abide in his presence, to go up in the spirit into those heavenly places. And sit in those heavenly seats called thrones. And to begin to rule and reign as a king and a priest. They go up into the heavenly tabernacle as a priest and minister to the Lord. Minister before him in the throne of grace. What does it say? If, if you lack anything, come boldly before the throne of grace. That's a heavenly place. That's a heavenly realm. That's where the throne of God is. And we can go there, right? We don't have problems talking about that. We have access to that. What we don't understand, we have been given full access to all of His kingdom in heaven. And we're supposed to search out the mysteries. You do that by going there. Going in the Spirit. Being in the Spirit. Being Spirit-led. Led by the Spirit. They are the sons of God. That's the word weos, by the way. The mature sons of God. 
So learning to ascend, learning to go in, learning to be in the Spirit. If you live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit when you walk in the Spirit. Anybody listening today? Okay, so another scripture, Isaiah. And not Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 33. Uh, you know what, ver, you know, chapter 33, 1 through 3, powerful. But I'm going to go up to verse 15. What does 33 say? 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Right? Okay, but what does verse 15 say? Let's read that. This is powerful. In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. Now, that's not talking about when David is king of Israel. This is a prophetic word again of Christ, of Jesus that's coming. In those days and at that time. So see, God has appointed days and times. That's why he created the moon and the stars and all this stuff. The timepiece, the clock of God. Right? That's what, that's what all... That, and this is what controls our days, our hours, our minutes, our seasons, all of that. Our years. Correct? The earth rotating, you know, on its axis and around the sun and... And around the galaxies and all this stuff working in synchronization. A synergy where it's all flowing together. Fully, completely, perfectly in sync with each other. Like a Swiss watch. In those days and at that time. See, God has appointed times. And I believe we've stepped into an appointed time. I really do. It's a time of maturity. At that time, and I will cause the branch of righteousness... To grow up unto David. So I keep saying David is a big part of this end time. Because he's got to cut the head of Goliath off. And he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Interesting. Because God said that judgment and righteousness are the foundation of his throne. It's what everything the kingdom sets upon. Jesus was going to execute judgment and righteousness. And as Jesus is, so are we. As he did, so are we to go and do. Correct? And so we need to begin to learn to operate in righteous or godly judgment. How's that? Seeing the situation through the eyes of the Father. Knowing our Father, so, being trained so well by him. Being prepared so well by him. Being matured and growing up. And being mentored and tutored by these pedagogue trainers, these spiritual rabbis, if you will, called the seven spirits of God that mature us. That's why there's seven. Seven is a number of maturity. Seven is a number of completion. Seven is a number of fullness. Seven is the number of God. Perfection. The perfect fullness. The fullness of the Father. All of who He is being revealed to His Son. Why? Because He wants His Son to grow up just like Him. I want to grow up and be like you, Dad. Cats in the Cradle song. <laughs> I want to grow up and be like you, Dad. But yet, we, just, we do what the song said. We never get there. We always put it off and never do it. Okay? And that was the sad part about that song. He ended up being just like his dad. Never had time, didn't take the time, and all that stuff. God is raising up a people that are going to mature that are going to move in divine judgment. What's the other word for judgment is decree. You don't have a problem with that word. The body does it. Or declare. To declare. That's what a judgment is. The judge sits on the bench. Bangs the gravel. Gravel. Gavel. <laughs> on the gravel. No. And makes a judgment. Makes a royal decree. It's what a king does. He sits on a throne and makes a royal decree. Whatever he decrees, that's the way it is. That's the law of the land. That is what is set as a precedent now, established as a foundation in the king's kingdom. This is the way it is. I make a royal decree today, you know, for whatever. And then it is so from then on. God's raising up a people that will do just that. To execute judgment. That's governmental. And righteousness. 
That's personal. That's inward. That's about a relationship. Because Jesus has been made unto us our righteousness. It's not man's righteousness. That's his filthy rags. But God's righteousness are the robes of righteousness that he empowers us with. That he covers us with. That he imparts upon us. He puts it in us and upon us to rule and reign and make these judgments. Divine, godly, heavenly judgments, decrees, royal decrees, righteous decrees. God's looking for a people that will step into this. Let me just finish verse 16 because it just proves the point a little more. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called. Who's he talking about? His church. His chosen people. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. The Lord our righteousness. Zadik. The Lord our righteousness. That's going to be the sign. The name. The imprint. Upon this end time generation. It's going to be a generation of. Of righteousness. It's going to be a generation of holiness. It's going to be a generation of mature ones. That move in the things of God. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12. I'm getting here. I'm getting to the end. You got to put away the foolish things. We've got to stop being immature in things. We've got to learn how to walk in the spirit. How to be led by the spirit. And say no to the flesh. Say no to our ungodly desires. Verse 12 says this. Zechariah 6.12. Another 12th verse here. And speak unto him saying. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying. Behold the man whose name is the branch. Who's the branch? He was talking about here. Jesus Christ. And he shall grow up out of his place. <laughs> Because he wasn't born in Jerusalem, was he? Nope. Bethlehem. Where was it the land he came out of? I just drew a blank. Mary and Joseph were... Huh? Say it loud. Huh? Nazareth. Nazareth. Yeah. Out of Nazareth, which was in the land of... I can't... I don't know. Huh? Judea? Okay. I guess. Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Who's the temple of the Lord? Is he going to build a third temple? Is that what he's talking about? In our day, because I believe this is a prophetic word. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Was the second temple, Solomon's temple, already built when Jesus arrived? When he was born? Yes. So it wasn't that temple he was talking about, was it? What does Paul reveal a mystery and says what? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are that temple that he is building. That's what I'm trying to say. And it has to be, it's a mature. Remember the word maturity here doesn't mean like you're fully and it's done. It's completed. It's finished. It means to be mature. It means you're, you, you're complete. In other words, you're ready to do like the Father. To carry on the Father's business as if He was present. Because He's now present in you. He lives in us. Christ in us. The hope of glory. Okay. And so. We're that temple. God's building. A mature. You know. It's not talking about you build a building. And then it, it, it withstands all this. Years and years and years. Well this building is 150 years old. So now we can call it mature. No. When it's complete. When it's built, when it's finished, when it's ready to be used in the fullness of what the original intent for building the building was. Are you near the building? The original intent and purpose of why you were created and made and sent here. That's when maturity, being complete, ready, fully furnished to do the works that Jesus did and greater works than these. Psalm 37, 25. This, this means something to me because I need to move into this. 
I've got to stop making mistakes. I've got to stop thinking immaturely. I've got to put the flesh to death, uh, so to speak. Deny myself the fleshly desires, the ungodly desires in me, the soulish desires in me that are not submitted to the Spirit. Verse 25. It says, I have been young, David writing this, and now am old. And yet, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You know, a lot of, we've talked this a lot over the years. Let me read verse 26 with it. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. What David is saying here, this is the true translation in Hebrew, not necessarily what the words they use in English. The idea here that David was trying to get across is, I have been immature. When he slept with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, was that mature or immature? That was an immature act. That was being led by the impulse of the flesh. He did a stupid thing. We got to stop being so stupid. We really do. Stop doing foolish, stupid things. Immature things. I'm not eight anymore. You know? I'm not ten anymore. I'm turning 60 next month. I should not be doing nearly as many stupid things. Foolish, immature. I shouldn't be thinking immaturely. My mind should not be constantly thinking about immature things. I should have the mind of Christ by now and setting my minds on things above, not beneath. I have been young, immature, done dumb stuff, and now am old. He didn't say I'm getting ready to die. It's not what he was talking about. He's saying I've got some experience now. Okay, I was young over here and I didn't know any better. I didn't know a lot of stuff. And then I was getting older and I still kept doing some dumb stuff like I used to do. Only this time it had greater consequences. And I actually hurt more people than just myself. You know. But I've got to get to this place where not ready to die. That's not maturity. Where I'm fully equipped. Where I have the mind of God. Where I start thinking like He thinks. So that I start doing what He wants me to do. I don't speak and decree and declare and prophesy my own will anymore. I don't, do my, I don't speak my own words anymore. Words of foolish words. Put away foolish jesting. I now have, I understand the Father's heart. I, David said, God said about David, he is, you know, has my heart. A man after my own heart. A man who is now mature and complete and ready to really rule as a righteous king. Make those righteous, godly decrees, judgments that establish something. Forever and ever in the earth. And that something is the kingdom of God. The will of God. The word of God. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken. Nor seed begging bread. Because what took place. What David was saying. He finally matured past that. And, and all these mistakes. And he repented a lot. And he finally got it right. He finally got over here where he was mature. And he was doing the will of God. He was implementing the word of God in the kingdom of Judah that he was ruling over. What this speaks of because the law of God provided for the poor. There were no hungry in the kingdom when David was king. There, there were no beggars in the kingdom when Jesus was king. Because the law of the Lord, the word of God made allowances that the, 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 the wealthy and the prosperous would take care of the poor. He wrote it into his scriptures, right? They would leave part of the grain in the field so that those that didn't could come and get so they wouldn't starve, so they wouldn't have to beg for food. The kingdom was operating in righteousness and every person was provided for. Every person was taken care of. Every person was just as important as the other person in the kingdom. No one was looked down upon. Everyone had what they needed. So. That's what he's talking about here. 
Now, when you look at the letters of this word for old or for mature in Hebrew, zaken, zain, kuf, nun. Zain, we know we've been through the seven, 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 and all that teaching. You know, zain, the seventh letter is like a crown, the sword, and the scepter. It's about a man or woman coming into rulership, kingship, to a place of ruling, a maturity. You know, you don't put a... Well, that's part of the problem is they put crowns on kids. <laughs> you don't give that authority to a child. So Zion speaks of authority and power. Seven, fullness, completing. Seven is, is this number for maturity. The seven. And it's the Zion, the letter Zion. The kuf. The kuf is actually the word for foolish monkey in Hebrew. But what the sages would teach, what the rabbis taught was that you have a choice. That it's a choice that we make. Remember, invited and selected, called and chosen. It's a choice that each one of us makes in our own heart by following God's righteousness. By being a doer of His Word. Can I say it like that? By choosing to follow Christ, not just through the door of salvation, but all the way through all the fields and the journeys and the valleys and all the way even to the top of the mountain to follow Christ fully. To be fully given. Fully submitted to His Word, which is His will. Fully led by the Spirit, which is God. So the foolish monkey can become a wise monkey by making righteous decisions for his life. You know, you picture, you put the cookie in the jar, banana, whatever, and the monkey sticks his hand in there and he gets a hold of it, but he can't get his hand out of the jar because he won't let go. That's foolishness. <laughs> if he lets go, he can pull his hand back out. Same way it went in. The ending will equal the beginning. We can't do it our way and have it all. You can't. That's Burger King Christianity. You don't get to have it your way. It's not special order just for you. We're all special. We're all His favorite ones. We're all chosen. But we have to choose to walk with Him fully. I was looking up some meanings of these letters. One of, one of the scribes said that this word Zalkin by the letters means one who is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Being set apart. But see, it's by the Holy Spirit. Not a work of the flesh not our works but his work in us and through us it starts with this letter Zion the first letter of any word is the the, the precedent that's set the, the greatest meaning of the word is found in the first letter the Zion you know it's the, it's the, it's the crown the scepter the sword it speaks of a king with authority and power are you with me okay the Yod is the second letter in this, this word Zion. This letter Zion, it means a hand that does the work. And the, and the next, the last letter is the Noon, which is the 14th letter, which has a numerical value of 50, which the Noon speaks, it's a picture of a fish swimming in waters. So it's a picture of life. It's a picture of the living, not the dead. <laughs> it represents Messiah. And 50 is what Jubilee, the great, the full restoration of all things. The great jubilee of all jubilees. I believe the 120th jubilee. The fulfilling of 6,000 years. Because we're at that place. And so, Messiah. So if you put these letters together, it's the hand of Messiah, Jesus King. It's His hand upon me and you. It's Him putting... Through His hand on us, authority and power. In other words, it's allowing Him to flow through us to rule and to reign as the King of Kings. The authority that we move in is His authority. And we're yielded to that. We speak with His authority, not ours. Remember the sons of Sceva? They spoke with their own authority. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They weren't part of His discipleship group 
Didn't say they weren't believers, but they tried to cast the devil out and they got in trouble, right? Hmm. Learning to operate in his authority and his power by allowing his hand to be upon us to complete the work that he's begun in us. So I'm done moving into that level of maturity as a king. But we have to understand, he makes us a king. We are not a king without him. He makes us a royal priesthood. We are not a priesthood without Christ as our high priest. All the priests are under the high priest. He's Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. Last scripture. Thought I was done. I forgot this one. Isaiah 9, 6. Just one of the scriptures that almost every church will quote this morning. Christmas time. Today is Hanukkah. <laughs> okay. The Feast of Lights. Dedication. The miraculous light. And I'm ending with this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Amy sang about that. You know her whole song this morning that she sang the special. Mary did you know. Was talking about a baby boy. But was going to mature and become the son of, the son of God. The savior of the world. The healer. The redeemer. The miracle worker. It's all about a baby growing up and a child becoming a son. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Shoulders always speak of government. And his, but there's a head on top of the shoulders. So we can be the shoulders, the government of God in the earth. But we're still attached and under and submitted to the head. And the problem is the governments right now that are in place. In the church and in the world. Those governmental, those shoulders. There's a false head sitting on them. It's like a two-headed monster. There's the true heads there, but they're choosing to follow the false head. To set under this false authority. This false identity. It's really a principality, a ruling political, manipulative, religious spirit. Demonic spirit. This antichrist, if you will. Opposite of Christ. Head. It's not a true headship. It's not true authority and power. It's a false authority and a false power. That operates. How many know the true head trumps. The false head. I said something there. I, I, you caught it. It's the truth. The true head. Is going to trump the false head. The false head is going to be severed. The Lord showed me that. But it starts in the church. The judgment of God, the righteous decree and judgment of God always starts in His house. His house has to be clean. His house has to be pure. His house has to be established. His house has to be built. Under the true headship, the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Unto us a child is born. You're born as a child, a technon, a immature one, no experience, no knowledge, wisdom, understanding, none of that. But unto us, a son is given. Jesus was born as a child, but then God gave his only begotten son. Jesus had reached full maturity. <laughs> the age of 30 began to do the signs, wonders and miracles. Under the anointing of the true Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. Right? And upon a cross. A son reaching an, a place of maturity. Where he would really be willing to lay down his life. And die for others. That's a mark of maturity. That's what this scripture is talking about. When we get to that place where it's no longer about us. But it really is about him. And we don't care about being seen or heard. What we care about is him being seen and heard. That is a church. That is a body. That God is going to sit his head upon. That God is going to release the fullness of his authority. And power in. To rule and reign here. 
as he does in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. His kingdom will be established. Hallelujah. Father I thank you for this word. God please help us. And I'll say, I believe the Lord showed me this morning. That he's going to help us. That he is extending greater grace. To help us mature. To grow up going to help us stop being childish stop being foolish stop being a foolish monkey and become a wise man wise men still seek him father help us to mature help us to grow up help us to put away childish things help us lord to let our minds be be stayed upon you and to be in perfect peace see this goes right with the teaching of the seed of rest maturity God help us to mature to grow up to the full stature and measure of Christ with the body in the earth I pray for the whole church Lord worldwide that the body of Christ would mature and fully develop she would fully develop Lord so she would be ready to be a wife to be the bride and to be a wife to conceive and to give birth and to reproduce sons and daughters in the earth. To repopulate, to replenish, to do the mandate that was on the first man, Adam. To fill the earth with the glory of God, to fill the earth with his sons and daughters. To bring heaven to earth. Help us, Father, to do that, to mature. Because right now, Lord, I'm, um, I'm tired of being immature. I'm too old to act like a fool and to be a child. I want to be the man of God. I want others to be men and women of God. That know who they are. That don't open our mouth unless you're speaking. That won't do foolish things but will only do the wise things that will be doers of the word not hearers only that then go the way and forgot what was said and do whatever we want do it any way we want however we want whatever we want help us God to be those people that are fully surrendered and submitted under your hand in Jesus name